Hey there, folks, and welcome to uh, As of Yet Unnamed uh, podcast. We're going to give this a shot, see what happens, and uh, we're open to suggestions. But we intend to talk about Distal and Dungeons and Dragons and the tabletop industry in general. And I have with me John, who's going to, uh, we're, we're going to co host this thing and see how, see how it goes. There's a lot of uh, new titles out there that are trying to uh, slay the dragon, is probably a weird weird way to phrase it it's Goodbye. what they're calling themselves so i don't know that that's what they're calling themselves i think that a lot of people are calling calling them that because uh, oh it's, that's it's fair nice clickbaity <laughs> yeah but um you know one uh, question that i'm particularly curious about is whether or not you can do that uh, go up against an industry giant without being adversarial because a lot of the positioning of these games and i'm sure we'll talk about a number of them is to uh, not just define how they differ from Dungeons and Dragons, but in some ways define how they're better, which uh, it, it can, to me, it reads like a, a little bit of an egotistical uh, take on things. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So what's really interesting is whenever you have a competing product, you need to start with a value proposition. So why should somebody spend their hard earned money on your product instead of another product, especially in a competitive industry like the TTRPG industry, where you're constantly trying to vie for attention, especially over a monolithic property like Dungeons and Dragons, you do have to show why your product might be better than the most popular one. Um, that being said, I do think you can get away with it without being necessary adversarial. And just for some context, the reason we're both interested in this is that last week at the time of this recording, Wizards of the Coast revealed that the new SRD 5.2, which is going to be the system reference document for the 2024 rules revisions, is going to be released after the Monster Manual in February 2025. And almost in response to it, the timing was just a little uncanny, uh, Kobold Press released the Black Flag reference document, the BFRD, um, to show kind of where uh, the Tales of the Valiant system is at. What was really interesting, though, was just their messaging around the release. So you yeah. sent me a screenshot of uh, a Twitter post by them that's like, this is the system reference doc you actually wanted. Right, and yeah, this is the update you, you actually wanted. And this is not... <sighs> I'm hoping that my timing is right, that I'm not misinterpreting it. But Cobalt Press has had a, they've got a mean streak of having a mean streak when it comes <laughs> to, to like being very adversarial uh, against Dungeons and Dragons and to the point of, of arrogance. And it's, it's rubbed me the wrong way in particular because I, I don't think that's how you should position a product. Uh, and so... Let's rewind to uh, to January 2023 mm. when uh, Wizards of the Coast kind of fell on their face a little bit by trying to repeal the OGL, which is the open game license. And uh, that's what third-party content creators, uh, you know, people who are creating content for Dungeons & Dragons and selling it and that sort of thing, uh, that's the, uh, I guess, approval, like the legal approval that they need in order to sell uh, those products without being harangued by um, uh, Wizards of the Coast legal team. Or During that time, there was... There was a lot of backlash, uproar. It's since not only been reversed, but kind of improved upon where they, they've they pushed uh, you know the, the SRD into Creative Commons, which is a very open license. You can build off of it. And you know, D&D is basically, they don't have to deal with anything anymore uh, as long as you have like just a, a couple of notes in in the document that you're uh, you're publishing. And with that being the case, uh, so at that time and before, you know, Creative Commons uh, was was announced, you know, a lot of anger and Tales of the Valiant, um, actually at the time, uh, Cobalt Press, they announced their project Black Flag, which uh, is now, it's a little bit confusing, but now they're, they're creating Tales of the Valiant, which is like, it's a D&D &D clone uh, and we can get into some of that too, but I... Uh, at the, at the time the project was black flag and it was meant to like inspire like rally the people up against this this uh you know tyrannical uh oppressive 
uh, stance that Wizards was seeming to take. And they, you know, they came out swinging in a way that I, I felt was really unprofessional. We, we actually uh, we had a, a podcast about this um, uh, a year ago on, uh, on Dragon Mind, just kind of talking about the release and some of the language that they used and, and that sort of thing. And they, they definitely went through cycles trying to, to pull back on some of that aggression uh, in the in the early uh, days of it, but but they're still like taking jabs, you know, at, at Dungeons and Dragons to kind of keep up that I guess that identity, maybe. But also they're they're also like putting their books on D and D Beyond, so it's like a little bit of biting the hand that feeds them sort of situation. I don't know, it's, it's weird. Yeah, there's a lot of I, I think the key thing, and this is why. Kobold Press is a little easier to dig on and why I ultimately think the answer to the question you started with, can you, is there a way to not be adversarial in this space, even as you position your, your value proposition and you explain how your game is better? You, we're not having this conversation about Critical Role's Dagger Heart system or the new MCDM RPG. There are times where they've been critical about aspects of D&D but it's not from a moral place, it's from a design place. And there are some very specific instances they can point out. Um, When Matt Colville does live streams, he'll talk about damage slog and explaining specifically how the way hit points work in Dungeons and Dragons. It's not very exciting. There's, There's this disconnect from the mechanics and the feeling that wants to be produced. And that's what supposedly the new MCDM RPG is addressing. So whereas... Kobold Press, it, it tends to be the opposite. There's not a lot pointing to why their game is better other than the fact that, you know, quote unquote, it's time for the D&D monopoly to end. It's all very kind of moral or ethics based, which is hard because a lot of community members are recognizing the fact that, to be honest, their product isn't as polished as D&D. Um, now, to go back to the OGL crisis of 2023, where you mentioned this is where a lot of this first started. I actually pulled up um, the comicbook.com article uh, that or I originally remember reading in the midst of the crisis. So this was published in January 20th, 2023. And the headline is that Kobold Press announces a new TTRPG system. And really, I didn't see anything uh, published by Kobold Press that refuted this. The promise we were given is that this was a brand new system that would compete with Dungeons and Dragons. And I personally remember being really excited about the idea of a new system. And then when that first playtest packet dropped, and one of the first lines is just make a 5e character, it, it definitely felt like the promise wasn't being upheld. And even in Design Diary 1 back in February 2023, um, Celeste Conowich, who was uh, the senior game designer that wrote this uh, this blurb, specifically called Project Black Flag, now Tales of the Valiant, a 5e clone. And I think that was one of the, the key turning points against Kobold Press is because, again, we were promised a new system and a clone, by definition, is not a new system. Yeah, and I, I too, was one of those people who was really excited about the, the idea of a new system. But now, and okay, well, this is gonna, this is gonna sound like I'm taking a dump on on Cobalt Press. Uh, I so listen, it is it is very easy. Uh, well, I shouldn't say easy, but this is gonna be a hot take. It it is easy to create a good game. It is very difficult to market uh, a game at the same time because like you can make make something that is solid, uh, and nobody will play it. And I see this in the, the video game industry. I uh, see in the TTRPG space, there's so many small, really tight, uh, unknown TTRPGs. And I didn't know that until I started making one myself. And I was thinking, you know, I just from my own experiences, it was kind of a, I mean, I, I identified all the pitfalls of of starting where I, I started, but I was really hoping that it was like, oh yeah, build it and they will come sort of situation, mm-hmm. you know, make a good game. And there's plenty of people who are excited about my you know project, Distal. But what I lack really is reach and I was excited about Cobalt Press because they are in the best position to create a new game. They they have an entire world that they've developed, 
you know, by virtue of creating all of this, uh, this 5e content over the years. And uh, for them to kind of like, like step back and say like, hey, actually, never mind. It was it was a little bit of a gut punch because, you know, again, like reach is is really important. And I feel like it was kind of a coward's way out. I mean, so think about it from a from a logical perspective. It's like they're working on on, uh, you know, they, they, they make the most money from from 5e. Obviously, that's what all their, their products are published uh, under. They will continue to make money if they play the safe game. Like if they if they make the safe bet and create a, a, a new like a new system that is essentially, like they said, a clone of of D and D, and they even have like conversion guides for for five uh, E material that kind of, kind of like backfeed into uh, Tales of the Valiant being their new system. But it was definitely it to me those messages between like like you know let's let's do something better than what we're given, and then they're like, well, you know, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe not uh, yeah it, it kind of like it left a really bitter taste in my mouth yeah well and I think that one of the issues and this I, I was really thinking based off of the Eldritch lore cast by Ghostfire Gaming that dropped yesterday um, I believe it was Ben Byrne was saying that th- one of the things that's kind of happening is you've got Dungeons and Dragons the monolithic IP and then you have all these other game systems that emerged as a result, or at least their announcement was uh, in response to the OGL crisis. And those smaller games are almost competing with each other. And it's not because of game design. It's it's their, my, my worry is that everything is being approached from, well, our game is better balanced. It evokes a better feeling. It's all about the game. And Dungeons & Dragons isn't a game. It's an IP. It's got a movie. It's got toys. It's got a freaking cookbook. Like, the the brand is so much more recognizable. So if you're trying to dethrone Dungeons & Dragons, you're not going to do it by creating a better game. You're going to do it by creating a better IP. And then at, at some point, it's not really about the game anymore. So with Tales of the Valiant, the the other thing that really got my blood boiling wasn't just the messaging, but it was their actions after the messaging. So when when Kobold Press unveiled uh, the Black Flag reference document, this is a quote from the Kobold Press founder and publisher, Wolfgang Bauer. It says, we're thrilled to bring the BFRD to the gaming community. We know that gamers have been eagerly awaiting this release and we're proud to offer them a completely open 5e compatible RPG. Wizards of the Coast did that. Like, yeah, exactly. So (laughs) they released, Wizards of the Coast released the uh, SRD 5.1 into Creative Commons, which is about as open as you get. And part of the hypocrisy um, is that Project Black Flag's reference document was released under the ORC and not the Creative Commons, even right. though they use the Creative Commons attribution uh, from SRD 5.1 in order to create the BFRD. So, and not that ORC is not an open license, technically is, it's just from my understanding as a non-lawyer, from listening to a few different people in the industry talk about it, ORC is a slightly more restrictive license um, in that, if you build your material off of the orc, you are now restricted to putting your material into the license. Whereas Creative Commons, you can take what you want and protect the rest. So I don't know if open is the best word for it, but that's definitely what it feels like, is that yeah. they've chosen a more restrictive license when Wizards of the Coast put their product into a more open license. So and this this license in particular was... Um... It's kind of spearheaded by Paizo. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. And their their effort was to create uh, basically a, a new OGL at the time. Mm-hmm. And this again was before like Creative Commons was announced for uh, for Dungeons and Dragons. I feel like that took the um, the wind out of out of a lot of people's sails. You know, <laughs> like yeah, yeah crush the monopoly, and then it's just like the monopoly's like okay, guys, we jacked up. We're gonna try yeah. to fix it. And listen, life comes at you fast, <laughs> so so maybe uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you know, listening to uh, to Sly Flourish, he mentioned this mm. on the on uh, one of his recent episodes. Um, he was kind of calling out that Cobalt Press is being a little bit hypocritical in uh, in using the Orc license because because they're not. You know, they are uh, the they're building their material off of uh, Creative Commons, and then everything underneath them uh, is kind of subjected to to the Orc license, and yeah, I, I don't think it's, I don't think the intent is to kind of like manipulate people or screw people. I, I think it's it's more almost like they kind of got in bed with Paizo's idea of of using Orc, and uh, and then it seems like it is a good license for further purposes, but it it is also just like just a little bit of salt on the wound, you know, yeah. when it comes to. Cobalt Press trying to be this like this counterculture, and then just falling on their face every step of the way. So, I mean, they've they've still raised millions of dollars for Tales of the Valiant and the the Dungeon Master's Guide uh, that they're doing for it. So it's it's obvious that there is at least a desire for for the product, and maybe not. I don't know if you want to dig into the product itself, but I was looking through the the uh, BFRD and it. Mm. There, it's very difficult to identify from that document what's actually different about their game. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, you know, maybe that's not the point of the of the black flag uh, reference document. But I do wonder, like, why I should even care when when even Tales of the Valiant itself is like it's five e with mods, and uh, and based on a lot of people's descriptions, it's like it's five e but more complex for no real reason. Uh, so I, so part of me is kind of like, well, maybe it's good they didn't make their own game because uh, mm. I don't know if they got the design shops to do it. That's a, it's kind of a, that's a dirty call out. But, and, but there's nothing that that I'm like, oh wow, that's a really good idea in in Tales of the Valiant. And I'm kind of, I'm just, I, I guess I'm just disappointed all around. Yeah. So I will say, in terms of design, as you'd expect from the creators of some of the most popular monster manual adjacent products like the creature codex which is one of my favorites and the tome of beast series um some of the things they've done with monsters like the doom actions all that stuff is pretty neat um to go back to the hypocrisy though the the reason i say it's more restrictive is because they only release it into orc and if we're going to call them a competitor, uh, Level Up Advanced 5e also recently released an SRD, uh, I feel like a few months ago now. And they did it both in the Orc and in Creative Commons. So oh, if you go to the Black Flag like download page for the reference document, all the comments are like, well, why didn't you put it into Creative Commons too? And that that's really, I, I think the messaging issue, again, comes back to broken promises. So to talk about the content of the BFRD, which is really interesting, there are times like under the barbarian part, it'll be like barbarian subclasses. The subclasses for barbarian are berserker and wild fury, which you'll find at the end of the class description, but there's only berserker at the end. And then when you go again, go back to black flag design diary one, it asks why, why is this, why should this product be different? And it says that, well, the SRD is in Creative Commons, the fifth edition Wizards of the Coast SRD, but there's a lot of 5e stuff not in it. And this was back when we recorded the episode of the Dragon Mind podcast. One of the, the quotes we kind of honed in on was, uh, do you want to just play a champion fighter until the end of time? Neither do we. And the oh, idea is yeah. that there should be all of the player's handbook subclasses in Creative Commons. Which is interesting because when you look at even the black flag reference document, not all of the black flag subclasses are in there. So the initial promise is different than what we're getting. And they could update it for later, but And they from, probably will. You know, because there's there's definitely like a, a lot of um oversights that they they need to to clean up throughout the document. And by the way, the BFRD is like it's more than three hundred pages. So it's right. Substantial. It's a substantial document, but just right. uh, for uh, the reason I disagree is because, again, listening to Sly Flourish's podcast, as someone who worked on these new books, one of the things he mentioned is that they said, well, you need a reason to buy the Tales of the Valiant books, right? If we just release all of it, then you've got no reason to buy it. 
which is just in direct conflict with right. their criticism of 5e being like, well, you've got some gate kept content in your player's handbook. And it's like, well, yeah, that's how you make money. Um, <laughs> although I will say Paizo um, releases all of their rules for free. Like all of the their mechanics, including supplemental classes and archetypes and um, player species, which are ancestries, like all that's available for free online, but people still buy their products. So it's just... It's just something I wanted to point out. Like, if we seem particularly venomous toward Kobold Press, it's because unlike Critical Role and unlike MCDM, they've made specific promises that they've demonstrated that they've, like, gone back on. Right. You know, I, I kind of wonder if it's just, like, trying to find as many advantages as you can, because this is a very competitive space. Um, I don't know that anything that Kobold Press is doing now like if they if they just shuttered uh tales of the valiant tomorrow not that they would but they could just keep creating the same content that they've been creating for the past you know however many years so how much is is it like a change in in directions kind of over time like i said you know the announcement of uh moving the srd to creative commons kind of took the wind out of people's sales but i i mean they probably had to pivot i'm wondering if they are Maybe they were focused at the start on like building a community and, you know, of, of support. And I wonder if they, if they were just kind of unable to get the response that they were looking for. So even when you do look back at the, that original blog post back in February, the vast majority of the comments are like negative, mm. like really just taking a dump on, on the preview that was, was offered. And it was just like, you know, riddled with typos and things didn't really make sense. And even the things that they wanted to change, which they were very like, you're like, yeah, this, this needs to change because, you know, we're smarter than Dungeons and Dragons. It's like the feeling yep. uh, of it, which, again, I can't stand it. Can't stand it when people, if you're in a design space, and okay, I'm going to rant a little bit. If you're in a design space, there needs to, at the very least, be a respect for the amount of work and time and effort and also the history and the constraints that other designers operate under. So to like walk into it and say like, that was obviously like, that's garbage, which is what it felt like in some of the early messaging. I'm just like, like that to me, like that, that killed any, any excitement that I had for, yeah. for the, for the product. Just cause I can't respect designers who operate that way. And I see a lot of them. So, so slightly tangential and I'm not mm -hmm. sure where you wanted to, um, to kind of go with this, John, but it's still in the vein of thinking about like, you know, creating like marketing positioning i uh, i look at dc20 dc20 is another new system that uh, the dungeon coach is working on and i i would say his positioning is so youtube content creator uh also creates a lot of homebrew for or i guess the third party products for uh D D 5e and is creating his own new system and uh he too is somewhat adversarial uh about or like in his relationship with Dungeons and Dragons. Um, sometimes he doesn't like, he won't name the game yeah. uh, in particular. And that always, it's like, it makes me like wonder why. Uh, at the same time, a lot of the classes are kind of, they're meant to be very uh, analogous to everything that you would find in Dungeons and Dragons. And in that part is, but the system is different. Like the underlying system is... Mm -hmm. Is different and i, I kind of wonder so you'll see a lot of his videos and say like this is the the best way to do initiative and a lot of that is just the clickbaity garbage that you see on youtube that's that's an unfortunate um byproduct of people trying to compete and also be successful on on youtube i hate it um but you you see him like specifically target you know different features of dungeons and dragons to kind of like hone in on what makes his game different and in that part makes sense like you, you're trying to to find uh, a niche find an audience but um but then a lot of the the ideas are kind of like improvements in in his mind upon D D, and we're basically trying to try to get a new version of D D. and i wonder how how much potential that actually has i'm sure his kickstarter will do very well it's launching mm. in june yeah I, I wonder how much of that that marketing positioning is is about finding an audience and trying to like like capture them um, and I wonder how adversarial you actually need to be. 
And I can answer my own question because MCDM doesn't do it. Daggerheart doesn't do it. Right, right. And both very, very successful. Yeah. So this is going to be a tangent, but it's something that's stuck with me my entire life. Um, so my actual career is as a professional martial arts instructor. Um, I work for a small business. I have seen behind the curtain of that small business almost my entire life. And over time in our community, we've had other martial arts schools enter the space. And rather than just seeing them as competition that needs to be squashed, what we try to identify for us anyway is just what unique strengths that other martial arts school has to offer. So for example, um, there's a martial arts school in the community that tends to be a little rougher. Our, our school's philosophy and how we teach, um, especially our clientele are mostly children. Um, we tend to be a little bit gentler in our approach. Whereas, you know, if you've watched Cobra Kai and <laughs> you've seen how Johnny Lawrence teaches, it's it's a little bit more militant, you know, a little more disciplined, a little more, you know, a, a harder style. We tend to just be a softer style in our approach. And, you know, financially, we've also been very successful with that approach. So it's not like it's it's purely an ethics thing, although that has a lot to do with it. Um, but if we have a student coming in and say it's like, I don't know, a 25 year old adult and they really want to like get thrown around or get toughened up or something like that, we, we can confidently recommend an, the different martial arts school that's in the area that specializes in that. They'll give them the, the service they want. And we're confident enough in our own identity to say, there are these things we can offer you, but if you're looking specifically for these things, like, I don't know, full contact sparring where you're whipping a punch at somebody else's head, we're just not the school for you. Um, and I, I think that Tales of the Valiant is an, or Kobold Press is an easy example to dunk on because it's so obvious that they lack that clear identity and that clear cohesion that actually allows us to assess what their value is. Um, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you. As I was reading through the, the Black Flag reference document, me mechanically, there wasn't anything that was standing out to me that told me it's worth it to, first of all, buy all these core books just to actually run it. And second of all, to take the hassle of converting my current D&D &D players into Tales of the Valiant players. Going back to the martial arts school, just... I remember um, my, the the previous chief instructor, who's my martial arts teacher, uh, just mentioning that you know back in the early 2000s or late 90s, um, a mom came in with her two kids, and she said, you know, there's a, this other martial arts school. What do you think of them? And he spoke very highly of them. It wasn't adversarial, and it was again because we have such a clear identity that we're confident about. So because we're so confident in who we are, we can shine a light on the strengths of another martial arts school. Ultimately, she chose us because we were, our values that we preach, that we said, this is what we'll teach your children, lined up with our messaging about our quote unquote competitors. So how you speak about your competition, the, the lesson I took away anyway, the less, how you speak about your competition says a lot about the confidence of your own product and because Tales of the Valiant hasn't spoken specifically to things that they're confident about, they're only tearing down existing systems. It just shows, it, it's an indicator that I, I don't think that this is where I should be spending my time. And even after, um, in, in the second or third play test thing, they had some experimental things. And the messaging was like, hey, a lot of people will read this and they won't like it, but trust us, test it, it's a lot of fun even that phrasing is like a lack of confidence. And if you're not confident in your product, why should I be confident in it? So I, I've seen like caveats when it comes to design a lot uh, to try because setting expectations is a very difficult and like an inherently difficult thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and so when you see um, MCDM, you know, I'm, I'm on their Patreon. I'm excited about their product. I don't know if it's for me, but I, I like watching the thought process. I'm, I love design just mm. kind of in general. And they are very transparent, very, very, very transparent uh, in each Patreon post with exactly what's going on. And, and I love that sort of stuff. It makes me warm and fuzzy on the inside, um, even when they fail. But one of the notes that I'm like, 
like I'm like, mm, okay, I, I get it. And also, does this need to be in here? Um, is like, you'll, you'll, <laughs> there'll be like a, a short little sentence or two about like, we don't need your ideas because we have loads of ideas on our own. So like, don't put them in the comments. And it's, it's funny to say that out loud because it's a lot of designers are thinking uh, about that because we, we do just have like, like anytime that you're designing something, it is a combination of the, the compromises that you chose to make the, yeah. the, the decisions and the compromises. And, uh, and a lot of people have ideas on how to fix a problem without the context of like why that problem exists yep. um, or the things that you've, you've already tried. So like, I, I get it um, from that perspective. And maybe that's some of the, the vibe that uh, Cobalt Press is like trying to, to get across with that, that particular line because they, yeah, another part of it is probably like they're probably gun shy because they've gotten so much bad or negative, uh, you know, criticism about their, their existing stuff. And they just want people to try it. And that could be the hardest thing. Yeah. Is just getting people to try a product. Um, my game is not a D&D clone. It's totally something different. Um, also very incredible and like incredibly difficult to market. Yep. Uh, so just getting people across the threshold where they open up the document and take a look like it, it usually at that point, like I've, I've captured them if in, in the first few pages, because if you if you can't identify why this looks interesting at that point, then don't worry about it. Move on. It's fine. Um, but even getting them to that point where they they open the document and then take a look is is a very difficult thing to to do. So if you have an existing audience, especially one that is as tumultuous as Cobalt Press's like current audience, I wonder how you can kind of like realign things to to fall within the place that you're you're trying to, uh, to create to, to me, like it reads, like there's a lot of flailing going on and they're still trying to figure out how to solidify this as a, as a core idea, uh, and product that people will like solidly have it, have an interest in. Yeah. And just to clarify kind of my stance, I guess, um, a lack of confidence isn't necessarily, um, a conversation stopper. So, MCDM, I, I one of the things I, I really respected about Matt Colville's approach coming out is he said, you know, again, we have a lot of ideas. And do you want to see how the sausage is made? There's going to be things we try. There's going to be things we fail. We haven't figured it out yet. Based on our track record, we're going to, and it's going to be amazing whatever it ends up being. But we're willing to try things. They were a little, le they were confident about not being confident. And I guess that's really the difference with um, something like Cobalt Press. And I haven't really kept up with DC20, to be honest. I haven't kept up with the marketing or the the playtest packets or anything. Uh, so I can't really speak to them as much. Uh, but what I can speak to is if you're going to come out swinging, you should have an idea. <laughs> if you're going to, like you said, right. if you're going to be critical of another designer and you're going to say, I don't care what constraints they had, you know, they should have been better than demonstrate, like walk your talk, demonstrate right. what you want to be putting out to the world. And for me, if I were in Kobold Press's shoes right now, uh, immediately after Design Diary 1, I probably would have softened and just not mentioned it. Just I would have kept the openness, but that would have been my value proposition is like Pathfinder, you know, all of the material we make, the Wild Fury Barbarian, the alternate valor bard all those subclasses that are redesigned that's why you would support tales of the valiant and paizo demonstrated you can have all of your content uh open and people will still buy your products so their promise of having an open system rings hollow because their actions aren't backing up their words i wonder if it all comes down to to goals so the question that i would that i'd have for you is uh if you're creating uh, a product of your own, what sort of, what level of success would you be satisfied with? And let's say that it's, it's in the same competitive space as Dungeons and Dragons are, are similar. Yeah. Have you, have you thought about that at all? I know you're working on your own projects. Yeah, I have uh, a thousand people. That's the first benchmark. Um, I I'd be very, very happy if I had a thousand people buy a product of mine. Um, and, and it capped at that. 
Uh, I don't know why that's the magic number uh, that comes to mind. I know I'm a smaller creator that has one successful project under their belt and it was super small in scale. Um, so I am by no means talking as a TTRPG industry expert. Any insights I have in relation to marketing or messaging or company values, again, comes from my 20 years of experience uh, seeing behind the screen, so to speak, of a small business. So, um, uh, and the other thing is, in terms of scale, like you mentioned, I am tinkering with my own system that is fifth edition adjacent. It uses largely a lot of the same scaffolding as fifth edition um, with some, some experimental tweaks. The, the benefit to a digital release is the lack of overhead. And that would be the scale I'd start at first is basically if you're willing to pay a few bucks for a PDF, like that's, <laughs> that's where I'm at right now in my personal creator journey. Yeah, I feel like a lot of um, TTRPG creators kind of go the itch.io route where they will post their game up there and then it's just pay what you want uh, to play it. Um, for, for Distal in particular, man, I got grand ambitions. Uh, so the the weight of, I guess, the the desire for success lives well beyond, um, you know, a handful of, of folks playing my game. Like I, I'm very much in... Uh, in love with the idea of creating a product that people can build upon and that has its own community and gets all the sort of smack talk and critique that you know other popular games uh, out there right now get. You know, is uh, is cumbersome as that may be to uh, to deal with. I'm no stranger to uh, feedback of that nature, um, and I think that if uh, if I could like create a mark for success it would probably be to the point where people start creating uh, games built on my system. Uh, I guess to, to wrap it back around. So do you know what uh, Morkborg is? I'm familiar with it. I haven't played or seen it myself. Cool. Well, they have a, um, they have like a creator's license that is super loose. Like I don't even think it qualifies as legal language where they're just happy that people are creating stuff for their game, basically. I have a link to it actually on on my backer kit, like all the way down at the bottom, because that's the that's what I would strive to to do is just create a uh, a, a base product, and then even to support the creators that uh, that are like interested in in building something uh, on that platform, and they they give you like like they say like yeah just don't use like it can't be it can't look like an official Markborg uh, title. And then you know use this branding and and this sort of stuff. They have like a little press kit, uh, kind of for for that. So it like helps creators. And again, their their license is like a handful of lines, very very loose and and open. I don't know of any instances where that's bitten them in the rear end, um, and hopefully it won't. But I think it's a great example to set, and at the very least to try. Uh, and I wish. I, you know, I kind of wish that the the OGL and you know Orc license and and everything else wasn't as big of a deal as it is, so that people can just create things and we as a community can celebrate that. It is an excellent ideal. Um, I I will say so. My again to go back to my martial arts teacher, who in a lot of ways is a very skilled marketer. Um, I, I know you mentioned that you hate playing the game and there are certain games we have very intentionally not played, but there are some games we have dabbled in because that is the reality of being a successful business. For example, I know martial arts schools that don't have a website um, because, you know, it's like it should be about the art. And it's like, well, it doesn't matter how good a teacher you are if nobody shows up to get taught by you. Um, mm. So he uh, has developed a lot of systems and largely given them away for free. But whenever he talks to um, like other business people, the first thing they talk about is protecting your intellectual property. So as well-intentioned as I think an approach like that is when the OGL thing happened, I very much disagreed with it. And I understood the corporate mindset of what was behind it. And 
no, I'm by the way, I'm not a wizard's apologist. I that's the one thing I feel like could that could come off from this conversation is I I think that a lot of their actions deserve criticism. But again, I think there is a difference between criticizing someone's behavior and criticizing their identity. Um, and so when, you know, wizards tries to destroy the OGL, you smack them and say bad wizards. But <laughs> like I I do think that the creative commons approaches is good because there is some very clear rules to play by. Whereas as, as well-intentioned as the Morkborg thing sounds, and again, I haven't read it myself, so don't at me, but uh, I, I can see why most companies wouldn't go that route. Because again, it, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's going to bite you in the butt until it bites you in the butt. <laughs> and then you learn some very, very harsh lessons. Right. I mean, we'll we'll definitely see. But uh, I'm going to send you a link to this after because it's it's wicked dope. It's like, oh, it's so good. Oh, it's so good. I love it. Um, and you know, what? I, I'll link it in the description too, just because it's uh, yeah, it's wicked dope. It makes me exi- excited just to even like it's fun to read too, which uh, you know is great. But uh, let's see where where do you think we should wrap up our uh, our talk here, John? I would just say that if you're a creator and you're interested in in creating for whatever system, whether it's Pathfinder, Fifth Edition, or even Black Flag, I don't necessarily think Black you shouldn't support Black Flag. I just I, I felt like the purpose of this was just pointing out the downsides to their approach that are very measurable by the response that they're getting, um, rather than focus on why you shouldn't buy somebody else's product double down on the the value that you have to bring with your product and through that there could be a discussion of some upsides and downsides for example yo-yo healing makes combat encounters less challenging which can make them less emotionally meaningful the upside is that characters don't die as often. So if you have players that are more sensitive, you're not going to make them cry. Um, so like, and again, it, it's like, it's not yo-yo healing isn't a good or a bad thing. It's contextual based on the, the emotional fragility of your players. Like for Distal, one of the things that really interests me about Distal, and we've talked about this so many times, is is the death mark system and how that allows, it gives you permission as a GM to create tension without making your players cry right away. So, right. yeah. So, yeah, you gotta um, play the long game. You're gonna make them cry at the very end. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, you make them cry at the end of the movie, not at the beginning where they walk out. So, right. um, but. Uh, yeah, just double down on, on your own unique value that you have to bring. And if you don't know what your unique value is yet, you're not ready to lead a community. That is, that is very good. I dig it. That being said, uh, thank you all for, for watching our first ever episode of whatever this is called. Please leave your ideas for uh, podcast names in the description below. And also, if you have any uh, topics or ideas worth uh, or worthy of attention, uh, feel free to leave those in the comments as well. And we'll see what we can do to uh, talk about them. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.